Right, Sal. Wait, that going back in time, Dr. Steve Danley. All right, here we go. Uh, hello, Dematha Nation, and welcome to our 75th anniversary Dematha Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Ben Flaherty, class of 2011, uh, and current staff member here at Dematha. I'm joined today by Connor Glowacki, current staff member, uh, who will assist me in conducting today's interview uh, with legendary and longtime faculty member and assistant basketball coach here at Dematha, uh, Mr. Neil Murphy. Uh, Neil grew up in New York, uh, played high school basketball at Sacred Heart in Yonkers, uh, and later played for two years at Mercy College, uh, where he earned his bachelor's degree in mathematics. Uh, Murph started here on Madison Street in 1985, uh, teaching algebra, geometry, and basic programming, uh, while also coaching the JV uh, basketball team. A few years later, Murph became an assistant under legendary coach Morgan Wooten, uh, where he would serve as his assistant coach for 17 years, uh, that being the longest serving assistant under coach Wooten, and uh, in fact, into math of history. Uh, coach Murph was also an assistant under current head coach Mike Jones for five years, uh, and Murph has also been uh, JV golf coach and the head of computer science department. Uh, Neil is currently in his 36th year at DeMatha uh, and teaches geometry and trigonometry as he has done for many years now. Uh, his dedication and commitment for DeMatha was recognized in 2015 as he was inducted into the DeMatha Hall of Fame. Uh, in addition, Neil was awarded the Archdiocesan Veteran Teacher of the Year in 2006. Uh, coach Murph's son, Brian, graduated from DeMatha in 2003 and his two daughters, Kylie and Kelsey, both graduated from Good Counsel. Uh, his wife, Maureen, recently retired after teaching at Holy Redeemer in College Park for 29 years. Uh, and this is a little disclaimer, but Murph is the undisputed all-time leading scorer uh, in the faculty senior game. Uh, and he says that there are no records of such stats, so therefore no one can disprove of it. Uh, and I know Coach Mike Jones may want to you know, weigh, on this, weigh in on this a, a bit later, but with that uh, being said, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Coach Neil Murphy here. Uh, Murph, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, before we get you know, going, I uh, just kind of want to see how is your adjustment you know, from in-person teaching uh, to online, uh, how has that been? And you know, how's it been going for you personally? Like a lot of things, it's been really difficult. You know, this is my 41st year of teaching and you know, last 15, 20 years, I haven't changed much, but this 41st year, I felt like I was a rookie again, having to rethink things and redo things and learn Google Classroom and all this. I'm finally at this point in the year, when we get to May, getting comfortable with what I'm doing and they're gonna end the school year up. And then hopefully back in September, we'll be back to normal. But um, it's good, it's forced me because you do tend to do what you did last year, maybe tweak it a little bit. I've really had to rethink things about what I'm going to do. And even when we go back to normal in September, I hope, um, I'll still probably incorporate some of the things that I had to do or did do this year um, teaching virtually. But I'm excited to get my guys back in the classroom. They need to be in the classroom. 100%. Yeah, that's, that's, that's for sure. Now, Murph, you know, obviously you grew up in New York. You know, the Yonkers area. Uh, how did you first hear about DeMatha and how did you, you know, ultimately end up working here? Well, to tell you that I didn't really know much about DeMatha. I remember we're going back a couple of years. There's no internet, you know, there's no games on TV. High school basketball is not what it is now. So the only thing I really knew about DeMatha was if uh, Notre Dame was playing and Adrian Dantley's on the TV or, or Lowe Wittenberg or playing where in a college game that would reference it. But you know, I'm up in New York. We're in the Catholic League, which is pretty big. It's a lot like the league down here, except there's just more teams. It's like 40 teams. So I didn't know much about it. Uh, I was teaching at Sacred Heart, where I went to high school. Uh, some guys on here may know about a guy named Danny Harwood. Danny Harwood's a longtime coach of Magruder, Montgomery County guy. I got to be friends with Danny. At the same time, there was a guy teaching at Mount St. Michael's in the Bronx who grew up with Danny named Pete Strickland. So we're going to blame most of this on Pete Strickland. But also teaching at Mount St. Michael's at that point was Mary Catherine Freeman, who now is Mary Catherine Strickland. So this is back in the early 80s. Pete got me hooked up with the Matha, and I came down here in 85. Actually, John Moreland tried to hire me the year before to teach physics. So my first phone, phone call with John Moreland, remember, there's no cell phones. I'm at a beach house in Seaside Park, so I'm using the pay phone. I got a roll of quarters. You can guess how many quarters were left at the end of that conversation with John Moore. Yeah. Uh, came down in 85 and been here ever since. 
Neil, you've been at, you've been teaching at the Napa for over 35 years, as as we just mentioned. What's been the most satisfying part about teaching and coaching here at the Napa, and why do you enjoy it so much? Well, the big thing is, like any job, there's some ups and downs. But because I've been here so long, I get to see the guys when they get to the other side. You know, when they get jobs, when they start their families, when they come back at the reunions that you guys run, at the basketball games, and it's so rewarding. So as I go through my normal day where I'm telling guys to tuck their shirts in or pay attention or sit up, I think about the guys I'm in contact with now and thinking, oh, yeah, it's worth it because the finished product ends up being pretty good. And it's not often we get to see that right away. So anytime I reconnect with those guys, I mean, just in the last couple of weeks that I and a couple of phone, phone numbers pop up I didn't recognize. One was Vaughn Jones, great player for us back in 92. Got a text from Bryce Bevel. Again, didn't recognize it. You know, Bryce thanked me for making him run for throwing a snow, snowball 30 years ago. Uh, Kenny Blakeney's back in town. My son Brian and I were able to play golf with Kenny Blakeney for up at his club a couple of weeks ago. And it was awesome. You know, just to reconnect and see how successful the guys are at this point makes it easier to teach the guys who really test you each and every day in the classroom. Thanks, Murph. So um, with that, we would like to uh, open up the uh, floor to the audience now. Uh, so if you would like to ask a question to Coach Murph, uh, just please let us know in the chat bar below uh, and we'll call on you and you can ask uh, the question yourself. Uh, so while you guys are typing up- well, Actually, uh, Ben, just before they type, yeah. it's okay to ask a question about basketball or Coach Wu. And whenever I do something like this, I'm always overrun with questions about the Pythagorean theorem and the law of signs. But we can talk <laughs> about basketball today. Great. Uh, so Murph, kind of uh, before, you know, as, as people are typing now, I, I read a story, uh, you know, Barbara Coyle um, did, a, did a piece on you back on your 20th year here at the math. And it was, you know, a story about uh, when you were, I guess, coaching high school that you, uh, you cut your own brother from the from the JV team I believe it was can you kind of give us some some background on that and and how how could you cut your brother uh, well one thing I learned from Morgan was to see the big picture so I'm probably only 20 or 21 I'm coaching the freshman team I didn't quite see the big picture you know so I'm living at home right my son my brother tries out for the freshman team and I cut him now didn't have a hot <laughs> meal for, for over a year for my mom. She was not happy. To make matters worse, I had a younger brother, Gerard, who probably wasn't as good as a player as Bobby. But two years later, he make, not only makes the freshman team, he plays a lot. So, yeah, that, that was a rough one. <laughs> good. So first question, Murph, um, we'll go with Bobby Hill. Go ahead, Bobby. All right, I'm going to make this simple. Two quick questions for you, Murph. Right. One, you know, when you got there, I was, I was just getting there myself. And the one thing we were always amazed at how you could, your mid-range game was unbelievable. Where you can get up and down uh, with the best of us. At what point did you realize that you couldn't come out and scrimmage with the guys anymore and uh, show your skill level? I mean, there was at some point that you were, quote, unquote, retired. And the second question is, as far as you being in the air and filming the games, with the math now, when did that, how did that start? How did you get involved with that? Okay, well, the first thing is, I stopped playing when Mike Jones started playing the faculty game, because he would never pass me the ball. You know, I'm not gonna be out there to set screens or rebound, you guys know that. Um, Mid-range game, it's because when I was playing, there was no three-point shot, Bobby, right? <laughs> so that's what we have. And I think, you know, realistically, when do you stop playing? When down the other end, you got to hold and grab more more than you should, you know, where you just can't. It's just not fair. It's not fun holding and grabbing. But fortunately, I found a bunch of guys up in Montgomery County, Pete and Danny Harwood, some other guys. Actually, Dutch used to play with us, and we're all around the same age, so we could play with each other for a long time. We just couldn't play against the young guys anymore, you know. Um, and then uh, the video stuff, streaming the games, they, uh, Matt Revkin teaches a class and they started to do it. So he had talked to me about it and I hadn't I'm probably doing that about five years. So I've been out of coaching, let's say seven years or something like that. And it was good. You know, I was doing other things in my life, but 
there's kind of that disconnect. You know, I'm coming to school, I'm teaching my classes and I'm going home. I'm not really involved in the Dematha community as much as I was. So what a great way to reconnect. You know, this past year, we were the only ones in the gym because of the pandemic. But before that, you know, you've been there. Every Dematha home game is an event. You know, up in the Kilby Lounge before or after, it's a mini reunion. And that, you know, reestablishing those connections is unbelievable. You know, and again, like I mentioned before, to see guys on the other side, guys that may be tested in the classroom at 17, they're a little bit different at 27, you know, or 37, et cetera. So that is, and that, that energizes me. And, you know, the one thing I missed was the really big games, you know, DeMath against Agat, DeMath and Polk, and all those, it's, you know, they get the juices slow. Awesome. Thank you, Bobby. Murph, is my does my micro is my headphone sound a, a little muffled to you? Am I am I coming in okay? I you're you're like, fine with me. Okay, I just want to make sure I hear like a kind of a uh, echo in my end. Um, next we'll go to uh, Frank Key. I know Frank has a couple questions for you, Murph. Frank, if you want to unmute your mic. I I just did because I I had I thought I was knowing uh, the coach there. I, I had to be prepared, so I wrote my questions down ahead of time. <laughs> Um, the first one is, what are some of the best memories for those out-of-state games where, where y'all went to those tournaments in preseason? Uh, I think you went to California, Missouri, the Carolinas, maybe even Florida. I'm sure between the coaches and the staff, y'all had some exciting times on the floor and off. I think we all know DeMatha basketball is unlike any other program. And the things that we could do in terms of, as you mentioned, travel all over the States. Uh, one year with Morgan, uh, we went to France for two weeks. When Mike Jones took over, I think it was my last year, we went to Japan. So, you know, what's the price for something like it, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, I remember one trip, we went down to Texas and they called it the Legends Classic. They had the four winningest high school coaches there. And Morgan let me take my son Brian on a trip. And Brian was, uh, oh, I don't know what he was, probably eight or 10 years old. Uh, went down there uh, and Morgan was smart he knew that he'd make those trips in December the way the schedule and it allowed for the teams to bond to get because each year it's a new team a new mixture in the air allowed for the teams to bond and get to know each other because as once we got into January and February into the league play it was a little bit different but you know, just a tremendous experience each each trip seemed to have you know a lifetime of highlights so it'd be hard to pinpoint any any particular one. What was it like to uh, have that winning season without a game loss? I think it was 1991, but I'm not sure. I know Jimmy still has the jacket that uh, y'all gave out for that year. Well, the 91 team was great coaching because it was really mediocre talent. And I say that because Mike Jones is somewhere on this call, but you know, <laughs> they were a great team. And, and if you look at some of the teams we've had in terms of they didn't have tremendous size, but we had a bunch of guys that could play. Mike Jones, Vaughn Jones, Dwayne Simpkins, Ted Ellis, Joe Wooten, coming off the bench, Milt Miles, Kevin Young, Chris Parsons, Rob Ritter. And they just played really well together. You know, they, they got the, the right people, the right shots. I think we had four guys that averaged, you know, everybody averaged like between 11 and 13 points. So it was really hard to, to focus on anyone. Um, but just another demand, a great team. Well, the, the last question is, what was your quote, standard, unquote, advice to keep the players motivated for every game, whether you, know, you were up, down, tied? How'd you keep them motiva motivated? Did you have a secret? Well, you know, you think about what made Morgan great. Any coach, I think, can motivate someone, just like any teacher. They can make you do something. Morgan was great at getting the players to motivate themselves, the way he set up the team. It was that internal competition. I was with Pete Strickland last night, and Pete said when he was a senior, he was a starter, he goes, if there really wasn't a threat to him, the backup point guard wasn't going to take his job. But even in February of his senior year, he felt like, boy, if I didn't have a good practice today – I'm not going to be starting next week. Um, you know, like most other things, Morgan had it figured out. 
And the, the final thing is, uh, and then I'll let you go. Is it true that there were some post-game meetings in the Maryland room at Lido's that lasted to two o'clock in the morning, or is that a rumor? Two o'clock might have been a little much, but yeah, Lido's was a special place. And if you know Lido's, there's the main hall, and then there's the back room there. And that's where Morgan would hold court. Yes. And like two different nights. On a Tuesday night, it's just the coaches. You know, it's a workday night, et cetera. But Friday night after the math of home game, that place was packed. You know, it was almost <laughs> like a college situation. You know, going to call our boosters, but our parents, everybody around the main dining room. And then we're in the back, and little by little, people would parade in and congratulate Morgan on a win and tell their stories. And they were all special. <laughs> And then the Tuesday nights were good because many times that would be when someone from out of town would come in. Maybe Pete Strickland or a Mike Gray or a Jack Bruin might sit with us. I remember Walt Coghlan came in with his partner, you know, ex-Secret Service guy came in and he was telling stories. It, just so many memories back there. Well, thanks a lot, Kevin. Thanks for all those good answers. Thank you. Hey, Frank, thanks for your questions. Neil, next up we have our colleague here at DeMatha, varsity basketball head coach, Mike Jones. I think I know where this is going. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> so first of all, I definitely dispute your recollection of uh, how the faculty games went. I pass the ball all the time. I don't know what you're talking about. So that, that's, <laughs> that's, that's definitely up for debate. Um, you mentioned the two overseas trips. And I know, like, obviously, I was on the trip when we went to Japan. Um, what other fond memories do you have about coaching at DeMatha that are not on the court? Like what things off the court can you remember and recall um, that, that, that really kind of epitomize DeMatha basketball and our experience with our young men? Uh, well, it, it all gets back to Morgan. And I think the neat thing for me was, you know, I could rattle off a bunch of great moments, but every day was special because Morgan was involved. So coming into work every day, you never knew if today was gonna to be almost a bucket list day where something special was gonna happen. So the year in and year out, and you know, Mike, as you've done it, just to sit in Morgan's office and hear him take a phone call or talk to a, a young player who's maybe at the crossroads, it just, I learned each and every day, you know, and just the way Morgan could take the most complex problem and turn it into such a simple solution. And you're like, man, why didn't I think of that? But he, he had it. Um, actually, here's one of my favorite stories that I, I think I've told you, but I don't think you knew the other part of it. Your junior year, Kenny Blake, he's a senior, Curtis Schultz, he's Troyer. All your guys are juniors, Dwayne and Vaughn are sophomores. Gonzaga is the best team in the league. We stole one from, from at the Christmas tournament, but we play them twice in the regular season and they manhandle us because they've got Dave Priegel and uh, Robert Church, Paul Lamont Morgan. They've got, they've got college players. So we play them in the championship game down at Gonzaga. Uh, we foul them early. They make a foul shot to run up one nothing. Curtis Schultz rips the ball out of bounds, throws it over the top, home run to Kenny Blake, and he dunks it. And all of a sudden, Gonzaga falls apart. We play a perfect first half, and we're up, I don't know, 40 to 20 and a half, something like that. So we go down to the locker room. We're playing down at Georgetown, and we're outside. You know how halftime works. The coaches talk for a little bit. The players go in, and then we'll go in and talk for three or four minutes. Two minutes, Father Danny gives a signal, sends them back out. So we're up 20. So, of course, I've got a bunch of suggestions. You know, we got to tell them, play like it's a tie game. we got 16 minutes to play. You know, we got to win the second half. Morgan goes, we just played a perfect first half. What could we possibly tell them? We're going to stand out here for as long as possible. And then we're going to go in, clap our hands a couple of times and send them back out on the floor. But that was Morgan just understanding the moment, what, what they needed, or more importantly, what they didn't need. And you know, that was one that always stuck with them. Yeah, great answer. And then one, one, one other question. Um, so if there were a faculty game this year and I promised to pass you the ball, would you play? I have to consult my cardiologist. And actually, Mike, you would have been the all-time leading scorer in the uh, faculty game. But one of your games was ruled a no contest. You played <laughs> legally. Um, 
you know, you were in, interviewing for the job with John Moylan. He put you in the faculty game, and we won in overtime, but the uh, seniors protested. Protest was upheld. We played it two weeks later. We finally got the shots for the right people, and we wanted to blow out. <laughs> That is a very true story. I, I have to acknowledge that, that that is true. Thanks, Coach Jones, and thanks, Murph. Uh, so I go, uh, we'll go with Greg Christel uh, next. Greg, go ahead. What's up, Greg? Greg, you're on mute. Sorry. There we go. Um, hey, Coach, how are you? Um, I, was, uh, I was curious if you remember when we went to France. Um, it was in the summer, actually. We, we went there for the for the play, to play basketball, of course, but we were there for the, the two questions or two points. One is we went there, it was like the 50th anniversary of D-Day, which was like amazing. We were there like the week after that. So I don't know if you remember that. And the second question is, do you remember the first game we got there, um, we flew in, you know, jet lagged. I think we had like the red eye, whatever. We, we flew all night. We get there, we bus like a couple hours somewhere. And we soon we get there, we have a game. Everyone's tired. Do you remember that game? Do you remember what happened in that game? If you don't, I'll try to remind you. Well. I think I remember this one. Again, we're up all night. We're flying through. We get there. We got to play right away. But it's a double elimination tournament. So we're struggling a little bit, as you might suspect. And then during one of the timeouts, Morgan goes, well, here's the deal. If we win, we play tomorrow at, you know, 1 o'clock. If we lose, we play in three hours. <laughs> so we picked up the play a little bit. And in terms of the trip to France, you know, another one of those great memories, certainly um, – Point to Hawk we went to up in the pillbox and we saw the cemetery and, you know, just one of those images that I will never forget. Um, I mean, the whole trip was fantastic, but that was, that was special. I also remember Charles Wiley in the dunk contest jumping over the shopping cart, the $100,000 dunk, because Charles had already uh, signed to play football in college, I think at Rutgers, but if he didn't make it over the cart, that career was going to be over. Good stuff. Hey, thanks a lot, Greg. Funny enough, uh, you know, we have Charles Wiley up next with a question. Hey, Coach, how you doing? What's up, Charles? My, my, It's more of a comment than anything. I just want to kind of expand on what Greg said. That trip to France was life-changing for me. And, you know, I think about the bus rides and how we all bonded during that trip. Um, so I just want to thank you for taking the time to kind of invest in all of us. Um, I really appreciate it. And that that, that um, trip to France kind of opened up my eyes to different things that I hadn't been exposed to. So I appreciate you and Coach Wooten and Coach Smith and everybody for even taking that opportunity, giving us that opportunity. Uh, again, it all points back to Morgan. But, yeah, that was, you know, a one in a lifetime. And it's, it's one of the things about the math uh, it's opened up so many doors, things that either I couldn't afford to do or just wouldn't have the opportunity to do. And France was certainly one of those. Um, actually, Charles, my wife is, is on here somewhere. I just saw her pop up. She was on that trip, too. It was you know, just one of those special moments. But um, And can you, you know, <laughs> Coach, when you tell that story about the dunk, can you tell them how far I cleared the, the, the shopping cart? How, how Unfortunately, there's no footage the of that. Nobody up. has a film of that. We there just is <laughs> footage. Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith has the tape. <laughs> well, it's on VHS, though. No one has a VHS player anymore. So, no, but that was, yeah, I, I remember thinking, what is he doing? But it worked out. It worked out. Awesome. Thank you, Charles. Uh, Coach Murph, we'll go to our uh, our current director of mission advancement. Uh, Brendan Shea would like to ask you a question. Go ahead, B. Hey, Murph. Uh, so obviously everyone knows about your coaching, but I will say you were the best math teacher I had. And I know that because you're the only math teacher that I did not have to go to summer school after having. So Does I that mean I'm the best or the easiest? You don't have to answer. You don't have to answer. But uh, one of the things that also people might know is that you kind of were the, the, the point person for the managers in the program uh, for a long time. Was there a particular time that, and you know, the managers do all the things in the background, but was there a particular time you remember of a manager really stepping up and kind of saving a moment or saving the day with something they were doing? All the time. Because remember, if things got messed up, Morgan wasn't going to yell at you guys, he was going to yell at me. But... One of my favorite stories is Teddy Smith. 
Teddy Smith was a manager. He's now a radio personality out on uh, the West Coast in Seattle, I believe. But Teddy I had in class was not a good student. And certainly the qualities you need for a manager is you got to be organized. You got to be on top of your game. But Teddy was, and I mean this affectionately, he was a knucklehead. Wasn't a manager. In his senior year, he's friends with John Sadusky and Danny Bear. He said, listen, I'd really like to be a manager. I said, okay, Teddy. So he becomes a manager. He's like he's a different person. He's Radar O'Reilly. He's on top of everything. So we go to St. Louis, late 90s. Bogus and Forte are on the team. And we're going to play in the St. Louis arena where the hockey team plays. And, you know, normally the guys go in and get dressed. And in about 30 minutes before tip off, the coaches go in and talk. And then they go out and warm up for 20 minutes. But we go in at the 30 minute mark. And the managers are all looking at each other back and forth like something's going on. Right. They're looking at us. They're looking at the players back and forth. And the players go out to warm up. And Teddy comes up with something. They listen. And the words you love to hear. It's okay now, but Jordan Collins had forgotten his uniform. It's back at the hotel. Now, in these arenas, the bus is parked in the arena, underneath, behind the stands. So Teddy went out, commandeered a bus, not our bus, because the way they stack him in, he's kind of buried, gets a bus driver, taken back to the hotel, talks to people in the hotel to get into Jordan's room because he doesn't have a key, gets it back. Jordan's in uniform before we even know it's a problem. But that's what managers do, you know, solve problems. So, you know, we can focus on the coaching, the players can focus on the game. But I always said a good manager is worth two or three players. Depends on the players, but two or three players. Thanks, Brandon. Good question. Neil, we got another question here from Bobby Hill. Well, I thought there was a pitch count here. I thought you get one question <laughs> or – all right, go ahead, Bobby. So I'm going to get off of basketball and focus on the DeMatha student. What's the DeMatha student look like today as opposed to when you started at DeMatha back in 85? You know, it's different, but it's the same. You know, you're still dealing with, for me, 16 and 17-year-olds. You know, the distractions are different in terms of the electronics, the cell phones, whatever. But they're the same. You know, uh, some of them are reluctant. They tend to be the guys I work with to try to get them to them, but they're all the same. The nice thing about the math, if you're a math student, there's someone in your life who's important that's making it happen. You know, your parents, your grandparents, your uncle, your priest, maybe your AAU coach, but somebody there has a vested interest in you. So you've got buttons to push. You know, you're not fighting it on your own for someone else. It's important that that student be successful. So, you know, I've changed over the last 35 years and, so the students a little bit, but you know, the job is still the same, right? Coach, uh, we'll go to uh, Dutch Morley. Dutch Morley's got a question for you. What's up, Dutch? Dutch, you gotta unmute your mic. Oh uh, man, I gotta, I gotta do a lot of things, Ben. I'm trying to figure out how to answer the chat, how to get in the room, listen to everybody. Uh, just say hello, Bobby Hill and Coach Jones, Xavier Red, uh, Chris McMains, good to see everybody. Um, yeah, my biggest question, Murph, is you keep mentioning Strickland and uh, every once in a while, Bray, where are these two guys at? They're not on here? Well, see, there's some bad blood there because they were here when I got here, and within two years, I had their jobs. You know, they're yeah. gone. I don't know whatever happened to them. You know? Right, I, I keep expecting Strickland to walk behind you. Usually, he pops in on, you know, classes and stuff like that. He used to come in, dressed as Abraham Lincoln or somebody in our Wooten history class. So uh, uh, he might be struggling with the technology the same way you are, Dutch. He might be trying to get on, and you know, you know. It did. It, it took me 15 minutes to get into the chat just to say yes, I have a question. So. Well, that's not bad. The under over was 25. I, I did well. I'm getting better at it, Murph. Hey, Bobby Hill asked you, uh, how, how in the heck did you become the voice of the Stags? I, who made that decision? You, you never answered that one. Uh, you know, you do all the basketball games on the radio and stuff like that. What? Who, who appointed you? Well, like there was another choice? You know? Uh, <laughs> that would be the only answer, I guess, that nobody else wanted to do it. Yeah. No, like I say, it's been great for me because I had become a little bit detached. I love the math of basketball. 
But if I'm the teaching at three o'clock and there's a 730 game, you know, maybe a couple times a year, it was a steady diet. So little by little, I kind of remove myself from the equation. So this kind of forces me back in and I love doing it. I have a lot of fun. Sometimes I do the games with, with Pete, although we have to pick the right game because we tend to get off the rails kind of quickly there. You know, the, the game becomes secondary as we just wander on to various topics, but it, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, good job. Yeah. Thank you. Keep it up. Thank you. Thanks, That's Dutch. May. Good to see you, everybody. Thanks, Dutch, for your question. Neil, I've got a question in the sense that you, you've been a teacher and a coach here for 35 years, and you've worked under Morgan Wooten and John Moylan, who the Dematha community have lost in the past two years. Can you just can you talk about them just as figures of the school and some of the lessons that you've learned from them both? Um, how lucky am I to have learned from both those guys and in two different ways, you know, the basketball with Morgan was fun, but you know, it was a big part of my life, but a small part of my job, the rest of it, John was fantastic. And, you know, they were both great. Whenever I needed help, they were both there for me. Um, you know, what's not to like. Now, Murph, um, you know, obviously we talked about, just talked about uh, John Moylan and, and Coach Wooten. Um, was there a specific maybe coworker or even like a student maybe or, or a player that you've coached that had, you know, inspired you or had, had the biggest impact on you during your time at the Matha, you know, besides maybe Coach Wooten or, or John Moylan figure? Was there maybe like a coworker or someone that, you know, as soon as you got into the Matha, you kind of looked up to them or, you know, they inspired you or helped you along your, along your way? Well, that was the neat part in terms of, you know, when I got here in 85, also on staff and people who worked around me were Rich Macheski, Ray Smith, Buck Offit, Joe Carroll, Doug Schaffelder, Tom Burke, Mary Ayers, Anna D. Luigi, and on and on and on. You know, it, it was unbelievable. And the conversations I would have, you know, outside my room, I'd step out in the hallway and I'd talk with Rich Macheski or talk with Buck Offit. We talk about different things, dealing with the kids, et cetera. I'd also talk with Joe Carroll, but I never quite knew what Joe was talking about. You know, he was kind of on a different plane there. But in that, you know, John was great in terms of running the school, but he let the teachers teach. So those guys that I've mentioned, or people that I've mentioned, set the bar so high. I never wanted to disappoint them. You know, they were so great that I worked even harder because I didn't want to look bad in front of them, in their eyes. And there are some DeMatha legends there and it's turned over. Certainly many of the people in the building right now, they learn from those people in the classroom or the beginning of their teaching career here. Um, and that's why DeMatha is the school that it is, the balance, because everybody knows about our athletics. Everybody knows about our band but they don't know what goes on in the building in here. So as we've had changeovers in basketball and football and the music department, the school keeps chugging along because we have that balance. You think about some other schools in the area that became instant powers in basketball or football. As soon as that coach moved on or new administration came in, they disappeared off the map. But we continue to, to move along at the same pace. And hey, Neil, hey, Neil. Like your, uh, like your broadcasting colleagues, like uh, Jim Nance and Kevin Harlan, you know, you're all in the same group here, especially in this past year with the pandemic. How has, how was commentating basketball games for you different? What, was it tougher, especially with no one in the, no one in the stands? Just describe that process. Um, that was pretty much the same. Uh, maybe we had, uh, more of an audience because, you know, the parents couldn't come. Nobody could come. They were forced to listen to me. I've heard some people turn the sound down or off unconfirmed. Uh, but what I missed about that was, you know, the math the home games an event. So, you know, I'd stick around after school, maybe ride the bike over in the weight room there for a while, get changed, go up to the Kilby lounge, talk to some people, get something to eat. It was a real big game. Ponton would open up afterwards. So that part was missing. You know, the electricity was there, but the basketball was still great. I have another question. Frank. Go ahead, Go ahead Frank. Um, 
Neil, what about uh, your your uh, co-partner there, Pat Smith? I thought that was a great combination with you and Pat. I remember y'all uh, coming with your families and in the old gym, and it was jam-packed. But I thought you and uh, Pat made a great combination working with Morgan. Do you, I'm sure you Pat, would agree. Pat you haven't awesome. mentioned him today, so that's the only reason I bring it up. Yeah, Pat and I started... Pat, of course, graduated from Harvard, came here. So my first year on the varsity bench, I was with Pat. And here's something uh, maybe you don't know. For a while, we lived in uh, Berwyn Heights. The Smiths lived right next door to us. So I have three kids. Uh, uh, my kids are maybe a little bit older in there, but we've been. And the Smiths at one point had five under five. So Pat and I are not only doing the basketball stuff, but we're working bingos, doing other things. So... Uh, my wife, Maureen, and Liz, they're running a daycare center with the eight kids. The, the, uh, the Smith's driveway was basically between our two houses, and that was just full of all those little kites, toys, you know, those little tight things, whatever like that, and the kids were running all around the place. At one point, I think Prince George's County came by to check to see if we were running an illegal daycare center. But a lot of great memories of the Smith's, taking them up to Cumberland. You know, Morgan would let us take our whole family up there, and the people up in Cumberland, they basically, you know, once a year, they would see our kids. So they watched our kids grow up right in front of them. As I recall, Pat and, uh, and Liz, uh, they were in the twin business. I think there were a couple set of twins in uh, that family of theirs. They, they were a little more efficient that way, yep, two at a time. <laughs> yeah, but at one point, Joe was the oldest, and then Sean and Maria were like around three, and Matthew and Nathan were born, so they had five under five. Awesome. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Murph, we're going to get a couple more questions in here, uh, and then we'll let you go. We have a, this is a tough question, though, from uh, Leonard Smith. Leonard, if you want to uh, unmute your mic and ask Coach Murphy your, your question. Coach Murphy, what's going on? Leonard, um, I can't get you more playing time, man. All right? <laughs> Travis and Jordan ain't coming out. You and Steve are going to have to wait. <laughs> what's up, Leonard? How are you? No, like I was going to ask. I was going to ask you, who was the best post player that you ever had the pleasure of uh, coaching? Answer the question right, Coach Murphy. Come on. Answer right. Leonard, you ask me a question like that, you're setting me up for failures. (laughs) I've got two grandchildren. You're going to ask me which one I like better? You can't do that, (laughs) right? Uh, But, I mean, that's the neat thing about the team. Each team is a little bit different. A lot of great players, you know, uh, as you go through the years and yeah, I learned from Morgan a long time ago. You never answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Leonard. I've I've actually asked Coach Mike Jones that same question, and, and Murphy gave me the same same response. I figured you wouldn't you wouldn't answer that. Uh, well, Ponton said to do that too because <laughs> if any of those post players are listening, he's going to try and get money out of all. Of right. them, you know? <laughs> now, Murph, um, just kind of want to go back. Uh, you know, I'll let you go after this one, but. Um, there's, you know, few, few people that have been at DeMatha for, you know, a long time. We're talking, you know, Joe Carroll's, uh, Mischewski, Shafali, uh, yourself, uh, you know, what, what makes, um, what makes you stay at DeMatha for so long? Like what, what makes DeMatha stand out from, from other high schools in the country? You know, we have that, that wall in the, on the third floor of, you know, teachers that have taught here for over 20 years and it's filled. We almost don't have any room left. You know, what, what, what does DeMatha do? Like, why do people stay here for, for that long? Uh, well, for me, I couldn't get another job. I tried. No one would take me. Right? But <laughs> seriously, I, I think it's the balance. You know, you mentioned that wall there with all the people. Yeah, you know, I've been here 36 years. I'm in the third row. I'm in the end of the third row. You know, we have Buck who's here 50 years. Um what is it, Joe Carroll and T are at 50 right yeah. now. Yeah. Father Damien, I think he, he left for a year or two, but he's around 50 there. You know, it's the balance um, in terms of what we have. Uh, certainly the sports was a part of my life, but the teaching is great. You know, I've often thought about because of the basketball, there might have been some other opportunities at another school or, or doing other things. Yeah, you know, I could probably coach somewhere. I couldn't see myself teaching anywhere else. I love working here. Um, I love being part of the DeMatha community. I mean, everybody on this call, 
you know? I don't know if they're here for me, they're here because of the demographic connection in terms of, you know, what we stand for and everybody knows what we do and how great it is. Um, you know, ultimately what gives us happiness is when we're part of something that's a little bit bigger than we are. And the math that gives us all that, we all have a lot of pride. In that. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you, Murph. And thank you to everyone for, for your terrific questions. Uh, Neil, for taking the time out to, to speak with us. Uh, Coach Murph, you know, I, I had you in class a few years and it's, it's bad. I had your wife at Holy Redeemer as well uh, for a few years there. So uh, uh, you guys are very special and, and DeMath is very lucky to have you coach. Uh, so thank you to, to everyone for, for your questions and, and Neil for, for answering them. Um, you know, as we conclude, we'd also like to ask uh, for everyone's support of the fund for DeMatha, which is critical to the uh, ongoing mission of educating faithful gentlemen and scholars. Uh, you can always give online at www.dematha.org uh, or uh, by mail. So, uh, again, thank uh, ben, you. Ben, is this the point where I announced my GoFundMe page for my retirement? So Ex I get my exactly. wife a beach house? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, but thank you. Thank you so much, Murph. And thank you for everyone for joining us. Uh, we'll see you again uh, next week. Thank you, guys. Thanks, man. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Coach.